Hello, welcome to the podcast, everybody. Um, we're we're here today with uh, our lovely guest, uh, Isabella Tam, uh, uh, always a good friend of the podcast. And today we're going to be discussing again more about the um, the rise in cases of um, racist attacks against API, especially API elders in our community. Um, if you're tired of it, um, it's my show and it's my role. So thank you. <laughs> um, so let's just kind of start. I think race has become a conversation more and more as of late. I think um, Megan Merkel's situation has really brought race into the forefront of the conversation. You know, the whole the, everybody losing their minds apparently for Dr. Seuss and trying to defend really racist stuff. <laughs> Um, I finally found the image. So, so I don't know about how, how you found out about the whole uh, Dr. Seuss company, like saying, Hey, we're, we're going to just stop publishing these because you know, it doesn't represent us. And it's the company's decision to do that. Nobody told them to do anything. <laughs> and so when, when that happened, I was just like, okay, well, well, what are the images? And then when I saw some news outlets, like publishing the images, I was just like, yeah, yeah, let's yeah, let's not put these books on a pedestal anymore. <laughs> yeah, let's just not anymore. So, but right. I, th- I think the crux of our conversation is is really focusing um, a bit more on, um, you know, the workings of, you know, the hate against API, the, the Asian American um, Pacific Islander community. So, um, and then congratulations to Isabella. She just graduated in December. I just found this out, but... <laughs> <laughs> And uh, did, do you have anything else that, 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 that you want to mention to our audience today? Um, definitely get yourself educated. Mm-hmm. Very important, no matter how young or old or, or who you are, you know, just learn and continue to uh, do research. Yeah, I think doing a lot of these podcasts and like really tackling the conversation about race and um, and some of these generations that, you know, we just kind of forgotten, I guess, in our history books more, more than often, more often than not. Um, and I think, um, you know, you were involved in Kenneth Tang's campaign, but when we did our podcast together with Kenneth Tang, he had this emphasis on like learning that history and learning that, Mm -hmm. you know, there is a context for Asian Americans in the United States. Like our history doesn't just involve Korean pop and, and like, Tokyo Drift you know it doesn't right. have to be just this small narrow view it's like there's a wider context to this and I think each guest when I bring them on to the podcast and I discuss the notion of race and um and um s- the stuff that has happened in the Asian American community it's like mm-hmm. we need to actually have it in the books that you know stuff like Chinese exclusion had happened Japanese internment had happened the uh the movement for civil rights um you know was also a Filipino um um, march for their rights so it's like if we don't have that our names in those books in those history books then it always feels like we're always going to be put into a little box that suggests that we're only these sets of ideas and identities and things that reaffirm I guess I know it's a hot word right now but like oppression I think I'm very I'm very thankful that Cal State LA is such a diverse campus Mm -hmm. and such a diverse um, team of staff who teach there as well Uh, we have a whole uh, Latinx and a whole Pan-African studies and also Asian studies but Asian American studies, I would argue, is a very different thing, mm-hmm. um, which is not as big of a uh, its own its own topic. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do have I did have a professor who did teach the surface of Asian American history as a whole. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The do you would you agree um, f- uh, with our previous guest before that th- the the histories of the United States um, relation with race should be taught like as low as elementary or at best high school. Did you, would you agree with that? I think I would say at least at the very best high school, 
Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think there are some educators that say it's like, no, it has to be the beginning. If we're going to teach ca uh, California colonial history, we should at least tell the truth to our kids if it's if it's fourth grade. Right, right, for sure. Um, th I spent a whole class just talking about education system and teaching the Native mm -hmm. American narrative. Um, personally, both our our schools were right next to a mission. Right. And I think that the school district has the they have the responsibility of teaching where how that community is founded. Mm -hmm. And and like regardless of like or I wouldn't say regardless, but like like both I guess maybe some of the positive, but more more often than not, a lot of the tragedies that come through that colonialization of 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 native people. And we we I believe like this has been a thing in since the founding of the United States. Um my only like gripe with the 1619 project is that it it like yes it it does highlight slavery but i think one of if you're saying it's one of the original sins i think one of the original sins of the united states if we're going to coexist or we're going to subjugate native people in the united states too so i think we got to recognize that story also on in on top of that too i think it should be a holistic understanding and a holistic history and like if we try to block things or 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 try to suggest that certain things doesn't happen, I don't think that is a good thing because we'll just continually have the cycle of racism. And I don't know, does, does that mean we should have a federal education system that says, hey, you gotta hit all of these marks or do we still leave it up to the states and things um, and how they organize things? Because I think California is pretty good it could be better. Oh, definitely. <laughs> you know? A lot of things could be better, but um, I don't know. We'll, I wonder who owns this uh, this issue. We we recently got a new president, right? Uh, we got. I do. Have we gotten a new education person? Uh, Betsy's gone. Yes, we we always have a new yeah, uh, yeah. staff, new administration. You know, I think our community. Um, is very special because it is mm -hmm. a majority minority community mm -hmm. um, that was founded on uh, the Gabrielino and the Tonga people. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just really disappointed that our schools didn't bother teaching their history to us, you know, because we're, we're all minorities and how, how this uh, shifted the immigration and and how people were moving around and, and things like that would have been something really cool to teach. Yeah. And also in terms of, um, from my recollection, like learning about um, California history and, and like that fourth grade, like unit on like sp Spanish colonialism, I don't even think there was ever a mention of Tongva or Gabrielino. It's just like native peoples and the Spanish co colonizers, or it wasn't even Spanish colonizers, just like the Spanish um, or the Padres. Oh, the Padres. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it wasn't necessarily a, I, I guess an even like lesson plan, sorry. And, and, and even um, a measured way of like teaching that history at all. I mean, for goodness sake, our area has three different, has three schools and all yeah. three of them have names related to either the land or the mm -hmm. Native American people. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, we live close by a school that what that was called Gabrielino, and I have like, oh, that's an interesting. I don't know where that comes. What from. is that? Yeah, nobody. Yeah, it's like no. It's like by the time I got into high school, it's like, oh, cool, Gabrielino. I don't know what that is, <laughs> yeah. and I feel bad. By the time I was an adult and and understood like what that meant, well, you you know, what's the Gabrielino Trail going through, like mm -hmm. um, the Rose Bowl and like Pasadena. Like, I didn't know that there was this like larger context and history yeah to this area but I, I think i think moving on real quick is like because we don't have this kind of like speaking truth to like history and like um and you know our education system doesn't teach that right we we have these situations where like these racist attacks will always kind of like still happen, you know? And w one of the things that my guest from the previous week, who was like, he's just scared. is like, he, he, he likes that. It's, it's now in the zeitgeist. It's right 
in the media, everybody's talking about it, celebrities are talking about it. But I think where the jadedness comes in is that, you know, if we, at some point, people will forget, unless we actually change something or actually do something to better the condition of like, like Asian Americans. And then I, I think also, too, we can do that with all other communities of color, like the black community, for sure, for sure, like the Latinx community, like we can represent all of these people. I just don't want it to just go away and just be like, oh, that was just a new cycle earlier in January to March. And like, I think, I, th I think he really hit on that fear for me. Like, do you agree with that? I, I definitely think, uh, especially violence and harassment on the Asian American neighborhood doesn't get as much attention mm -hmm. um, as as it should get definitely it's it's really hard because since the Asian American is a model minority mm -hmm. um, by the way it, it's I, I it's a myth I know um, yeah. disclaimer yeah um, it, it's just really hard because a lot of Asian Americans are expected not to speak out about these mm -hmm. issues because there's so much going for us I mean, you know we're we're good at stem and we get hired for jobs and it's it's just really unfortunate that people don't recognize that racism does hit the asian american community mm -hmm. and then putting that model minority kind of idea into like on a pedestal it just makes it assumes that um that other communities it's like oh if the asian can do this why can't you do it you know right, and it's right. just it, it's 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 a way to like set boundaries and and create this sort of like infighting that that is is probably a cause for a lot of the problems it's like it's i saw with last year during the summer when all everything that happened with brianna taylor and george floyd there was this solidarity amongst many communities of color mm -hmm. and i think the right now with the the news reports of the um that were coming out there were some places that was like oh what oh why aren't like you know the black community coming up with the you know the asian community to stand up for them when they did it black lives matter it's like what is that news cycle like what are you trying to say here you're you're ensuing this notion that you're, you're making a, a division line between one one community to another and i was just like it, it was the most I don't know. In my mind, I was just like, this doesn't look good if a news network is saying these things. There's a lot of reasons. And also, it's it's really dangerous um, to to create that divide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 rough. And I, I'm I'm scared in that sense, because it's just like it's it's not a constructive conversation to have and I don't think uh, we should pin one group over another group or say that oh that if a black person were to do this to an Asian person then it all black uh, people like there are reasons for violence and then we need to attack that reason and make sure it doesn't happen again you know like this violence against Asian uh, communities should be addressed and um, I, I know that you mentioned it earlier but like the the idea of like being quiet and like n you know not reporting these things i think that is also part of that model minority myth you know that that notion is like i don't want any trouble or like what is there to gain if i report this like there's nothing that's going to happen and um i think recently i um uh, i think washington state is like putting forward it's like any violence against asian americans should be categorized as as a hate crime and then in my mind i was thinking it's like wait wasn't shouldn't that already be in the books already you know i just thought that was insane yeah, yeah. well i think a lot of it also has to stem from from asian culture as well mm -hmm. where face is a very important um value or mm -hmm. or like representation you have to have you have to look good in front of other people mm -hmm. and when you're reporting crimes and stuff these numbers don't look good for the asian community or saying that i was a victim of a of a racist attack you lose face mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So I feel like a lot of Asian Americans or maybe like older folks mm-hmm. don't want to don't want to lose that. Don't want to admit that they're victims. But if when I, I do agree and th- there there are cases in my own family that where where that is the case, you know, like they, they, they're just like, well, it's not you know, report this, it's like, if, as long as we're okay, then, then we're fine. We just don't. But if, if you see in your communities, especially in California and um, the recent attack from that teacher at that bus stop, like oh, mm-hmm. if, if it becomes, I, I hate to say it, if it comes closer and closer and closer, it's like, well, where does that non-reporting argument fall, falls apart? If your neighbor is is gonna get killed through a racist attack, when at what point are you gonna call um, and call it out? Um, and right. I, I'm not and, I'm not chastising right. the elderly community or anything, but I think this is just an argument to say, hey, like at what point will you say something? Sorry, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I definitely agree with you that even though it's 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 not it's never a good thing to say you're a victim of a violent mm-hmm. attack um but it's very important to definitely report and get the numbers out there and that's how you gain support and then how you acquire help for for this community and for for this unfortunate event yeah it's it's really kind of the first step in in actually tangibly like addressing the issue is to understand right. recognizing there is an issue here yeah recognizing there's an issue and then and then actually filing it and getting the data to right it's not one independent issue it's mm-hmm. you know continuous attacks on on our community yeah and i imagine like that that is hap- happening in like many like data driven organizations trying to Mm -hmm. um address certain things like poverty and like substance abuse and all of these things and like i just feel that there wasn't necessarily a like wide report that that i've known in my mind that actually really addressed the issues in the asian community like i think because it's treated as a monolith that is treated as this um, pillar of success or like this singular idea that oh yeah well if we're Asian therefore we're always successful well that's not the case if that was the case like l- let me tell you this if that was the case across the board I'm pretty sure you'll find millionaire like Vietnamese people millionaire like Laos or Hmong or all of these people like no like the data shows like there are groups of us Asian Americans that don't have the resources as our East Asian counterparts or our South mm-hmm. Asian counterparts. And like, because we're just put in this box that say, oh yeah, Asian equals success. It's like, what does that mean if we don't have the resources to be that success? Yeah. I think actually recently, mm-hmm. um, I had come across, we're we'll talking about anti-Asian bias. Mm-hmm. Um, that there's, if you're trying to work in a higher level of government, my my mom was telling me how it's harder for Asian people to get into that, that field um, mm. because of China and how the, their spies and taking their technology and intelligence. Mm-hmm. That 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 is also true, isn't it? Yeah. Like the, there is a, there are some like reports that were happening earlier this year of like um folks getting in the hot water and like understanding like oh yes some of that is happening right right i but, mean you have uh, your but, incident with huawei and and elaine mm-hmm. chow now recently yeah and i and i was like thinking it's like wait how do i know this name elaine chow and then i was like oh, okay mitch mcconnell what you yeah. doing <laughs> yeah yep yep i mean a lot of folks uh I had I had an interesting a couple of interesting conversations where they would say that it's a late Chow that should be punished. Mm-hmm. Um, my argument is both. I I feel like Mitch McConnell, of course, ha- brought her in some way somehow. Mm-hmm. Uh, while she used him as a channel to get into our government, mm-hmm. so he should also be responsible. But does that suspicion, uh, like or or only of course you can prove it. Only, of course, if you can prove yes. it. Like, does yes. that um, does that 
like not allow like Asian Americans into like spaces of government or governance, you know, like whether it is your local um, like HOA all the way up to the presidency, you know? Um, right. Yeah. I mean, it makes it makes Asians look bad because there are so few Asians that Asians in higher level of government. Mm -hmm. And that one Asian just happens to be uh, having really close ties with the Chinese government. Yeah, it's it's really unfortunate. Well, also too, like it, like in the case of like very like legitimate like politicians and things like that, they were they are put in the pedestal and say, "Hey, like we got Judy Chu, we don't need anybody else." You know, like we'll we'll just have the represent representation stop at Judy Chu, and I was just like, "That that's not right." You know, right. Like, I like what she does and like what she represents and like you know she's she's done a lot for our communities, but you know like if they stay so long, it becomes like this uh, Nancy Pelosi thing where it's like, why haven't you foster, you know, younger leaders and, and individuals into, um, uh, into spaces of power? And I'm not saying that Judy Chu doesn't do that, but I'm saying like it, it, it has the optics of, of having that tinge of like, oh, you're just right. trying to keep your power. It's like, how long are you going to stay in this, this thing for, uh, for how many years? Um, I hope that there will be more, you know, students, kids that are looking into politics and saying like, hey, like, I need more people that represents me and sit and looks like me in these um, in these um, spaces of power, almost. Right. And I'm super excited for what our Congress might look in the future, mm -hmm. because it is the most diverse uh, group of people we have ever mm -hmm. in Congress. I want to ask you one thing, um, and um, I've been following a lot of, like, there were some people that I know that was like, oh, since Trump gone, are you just going to go back to sleep and not, like, think about politics? I'm like, dude, I'm, like, I'm making sure that there's no Trump again in the White House ever again, so I'm going to follow this continuously. But the, um, during the late end of January, um Biden's um, wrote an executive order to move funding to understand, um, you know, what had happened with, you know, Asian American bias, like through through the year of, of COVID and like maybe beyond that. Mm -hmm. I wonder, in my mind, because he he set that tone, do you think there was violent like the violence had heightened? because of that or you know it, it was it was a combination of maybe three things it was like his executive order uh, lunar new year was around that corner and then um frustrations about uh, coronavirus for me i i think the race the the racist the racism kind of like festered mm -hmm. um we definitely when coronavirus first hit uh the united states a lot of asian mom and pop restaurants didn't get as much uh didn't get as much customers anymore mm -hmm. um, maybe because people have decided to stay home more but also there might be that anti-asian sentiment uh saying oh asians brought corona over if i go to an asian restaurant am i gonna catch covid yeah um and i know that was definitely a, what some people were thinking mm -hmm. um so i would say it probably started there and that was never addressed mm -hmm. so people were able to kind of push the limits of how how anti-Asian, how racist can I get? Mm -hmm. um, which, unfortunately, violence uh, was, was the point. Yeah, it, it does seem to be that it was a rolling thing from the very, very beginning of this mm -hmm. pandemic. And it wasn't just like what, what I was alluding to, that it was just this certain thing that happened at this certain injunction at time. Um, and I think it was, a, it was a building effect. And it's like, yeah, I think NBC just recently said that I think, um, you know, restaurants have been getting like less and less business because of coronavirus. But I guess disproportionately Asian or an Asian run businesses have been um, has been losing more money than than other restaurants. And like, yeah, I th you start to see a pattern there. And um, and I was talking about this um, before we, we have a family that owns a donut shop. And then we said we kept on getting. Uh, reports to the health department 
and like maybe two or three was fine right and you were just like okay well we'll just need to make sure we do better right when it becomes five and six you start to think hey what's going on why is it like in the span of a summer we're getting investigated over and over and over and over again it's like what how wait like are you just reporting us because we're the only two asian businesses in this plaza right and then maybe my family doesn't understand that but i see it i'm just like hey i see a pattern here if if the white business a few doors down aren't getting the same like health violations or like health reports as you do then there's a pattern here <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah um my 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 family has a plumbing business mm-hmm. and i feel like we always get checked for 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 employee safety from OSHA mm-hmm. and uh, our, our workers don't speak or a lot of them have very minimal English uh, knowledge and when, when they do do checks they they always call us so we can like saying oh we're doing checks but I'm wondering why are they always doing checks you know mm-hmm. we we do have all the safety procedures and all the equipment that they need Mm -hmm. Um, they're also trained and they're experienced Uh, they know what what to do and what not to do so it it's it it feels like they're also kind of targeting um, non-english speakers in general i was yeah i was also thinking about that i remember osha and like um, there was this john oliver bit about you know meat packing industry and their safety Mm -hmm. through through coronavirus and like osha is already uh, like a defunded pro- like agency within yeah, government. it's not and and for OSHA to focus more on Asian businesses than than like these <laughs> meat packing industry things that have giant lobbies and things like that. Of course, they have giant lobbies. They could do that, but but for them to investigate more on like okay, well, I guess I'll just investigate more of these Asian community businesses. <laughs> no wasting their time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's it's it just shows like how much it's it's like it's an institution that that these things are are in place that like yeah because what we said in the beginning there is no history or recognition of these past um um treatment of Asian um individuals right like it'll just continue to faster and like even in our institutions like regardless if they feel themselves as like oh i'm not racist i'm not the this type of person that you set me out to do but you grew up in a space where you don't learn these these histories you don't recognize yeah this this terrible thing the the trail of tears yeah this happened in your state or if um the massacre in la where i i believe um you, you know 15 to 17 people of chinese descent were lynched right mm-hmm. in in like what's the historic downtown of los angeles you know that right. is asian history so i th- i hope that in my heart is of hearts because it's a di- diverse administration it is an administration that's trying to do its best to tackle like the issues that were just ignored for the past four years but i guess as a citizen i'm just saying like okay i'm gonna hold you to it like mm-hmm. i can't just like what some of my friends say it's like oh i'm just gonna go back to sleep because trump is gone right right yeah there's more work to be done <laughs> yeah would you agree with that i i totally think so and i agree that like talking and spreading awareness is a huge mm-hmm. um it, it it's towards the path of of learning and learning from the past and trying to to fix that and, and improve mm-hmm. on that. But I think that not only talking about the issue, maybe just also thinking about solutions and mm-hmm. things we can do. Yeah, and just way to is very important. Like we we've had um you know the the black community and George Floyd and, and Breonna Taylor. It's like, you know, we've done we've done the awareness campaign what have you done for us lately? <laughs> Essentially, you know, mm-hmm. like we, we've, we gave you the numbers, we've done the data, we crunched the numbers. It's like, this has been going on for generations and you're just standing there saying, well, yeah, we can't do anything about it. Right. Yeah. Right. So, and I feel like 
Vincent Chin mm -hmm. is probably the closest we have to a, or at least in terms of receiving enough coverage from from media mm -hmm. uh, compared to the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. It's still not, I feel like nothing was learned from that incident. So, mm -hmm. and nothing has really changed. And as you know, out of the uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor incidents, uh, there has been more police training implemented, though I don't know how effective that is. Mm -hmm. uh, and with uh, Breonna Taylor's incident, there has been a change in policy where police cannot go into somebody's home in the middle of the night. And then just like... But only in that area. It, it's, yeah. not, it's not all across America. It's just where... What, what's... Which I'm not sure if it was a state or if it was a, a county. I well, think I think it was a county. I th because there were several other counties in other states where that were just implementing like Brianna's law or like the um mm -hmm. the basically the no knock warrant, like trying to right, say, right. Like, yeah, let's not do that anymore. Um, but yeah, I just I think even in Louisville, they, they didn't even put that into law, like the the uh, the place where Brianna was killed. Yeah. And I think that there was an assumption that, oh, if we just pay off these families, you know, you know, dollars and cents, it's like, well, that's not justice. No, it, it's not. And no. her life is worth more than anything money can buy. Yeah, exactly. And somebody that's so close in my age, too, you know, and. And on top of that, a person that wanted to tackle this coronavirus um, um, pandemic as an EMT person, you know, as a person that was working in the medical industry. I'm just mm -hmm. like, well, how how can you stand by and just say like, oh, yeah, her death is justified or like, you know, you're not going to give all the data to the grand jury at all. You know, I think there was a famous uh, vice investigation where they just went down and just said, hey, so here's are the things that were presented to the jury. And here were the things that wasn't presented to the jury. And like, and like all the weird corruption things that were like working in the background that the the wheels and the mechanisms that that were working to just basically say like, well, like, we'll just charge them for basically endangering the, the the tenants on the other end of the building i was just like wait well, what does that mean for this per this the boyfriend that lost a girlfriend right a mother that lost a daughter and a community hurting for not revenge but justice you know i think i think there was a, a a famous um um a community leader that was just like using the um, like the analogy of monopoly and like, you know, like the frustrations and like, like contextualizing writing, whether or not you like it or not, but like it comes from somewhere, you know, um, but at the end of her kind of like diatribe, like her, her kind of um, speech she had, she, she said, you're, you're just lucky that we're just looking for justice, not revenge, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, because you know, what will, what would be gained by that? Like right. if, if, if violence is the only option. And I think tying this into the Asian American community um, about the argument, how, oh, other, other ethnic or cultural or, or uh, race groups are not supporting uh, the Asian violence cause, anti-Asian mm -hmm. violence cause. It's because I feel like there's still racism. Like you, you can be a you can be a non-white person and still be racist. Right. And I think that's very prevalent also in our, our Asian neighborhood. Why are, why should we support the black community? Why should we support the African American community? Mm -hmm. You know, why is Breonna Taylor? Why is George Floyd relevant to us? Mm -hmm. Um. And I think that. It, you, know, you have to seek to understand um, and empathize with other people before you can expect other people to to try and, and understand you and support, support you, yourself. You, yeah, it, it, it co goes back to the idea of like, you don't just want to be not racist. You want to be actively anti-racist. But like, I want to add a little bit more into that and just say like, there is more within yourself 
before you start learning, you need to understand yourself and what, how you grew up. Like, what are mm -hmm. some of the prejudices you have because your family had, you know, dictated it to you? Or, you know, like you need to address those things before you become that person that say, okay, well, how do I want to address it as an individual? How do I want to learn about, you know, the Black community? If for myself, I lived in a family that constantly perpetuated it. And I'm not saying my family has done that, but like there are some community members that that was their reality for the longest time. How do you need, how do you unpack those lessons that you've gotten as a child to make sure you become a better community member to say, Hey, I've educated myself. What's the next step? How can I be an ally to your cause? Or like, right. how can I be a better person? And like, for me, like as, you know, graduated and, you know, f have worked in like education for a little bit. And like, I, I can't claim to be a teacher because like, that's not necessarily right of me to do that. But I know enough that when George Floyd happened, I need to understand myself and like how, why, why the reasons why I never watched, you know, or consume black art or black media or, you know, understand black philosophers like James Baldwin and Malcolm X and, you know, um, MLK or like Angela Davis, you know, understand how they see themselves and how to move forward. And, and so I just, mm -hmm. yeah. I think we should totally learn from, from the black community because they have a much longer history than, than Asian, mm -hmm. than the Asian community has. And we can definitely learn about their struggles. And it's very relevant to, to all minority communities out here. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that in the Asian community, why it's so such a foreign concept about race and understanding identity is because a lot of the Asian, it, it is a stereotype, but it is somewhat true that there's no push for Asians to get into history. There's no push for Asians to get into politics or, or art, uh, which I think it, it's a form of expression. And a lot of artists use it to express the press oppression that has happened mm -hmm. um, to, to that community. And the Asian community generally deters their younger folks from going into these industries, which doesn't allow us to research our own uh, our own histories or d d like not put stories that you know relate to like everyday struggles uh, that asian american communities have faced you know like if our examples of american like like if of asian excellence are set to you know rich vietnamese millionaires and crazy rich asians it's mm -hmm. like what, what what like are we perpetuating like though it is important to have representation what does it ultimately say if w the only stories that you know that we want to tell just reaffirms that oh we're already successful right right there's there's always there's an appropriate representation mm -hmm. of course it's I think a lot of um, Asian families, their parents or their relatives came from a, a poor, like, uh, developing world background. Mm -hmm. And so in their mind, success and the American dream and what they would push their children to achieve is economic success mm -hmm. and not identity, which I think being able to figure out your own identity is also a, a success. It's a privilege to be able to to focus and to take the time to research and understand who you mm -hmm. are. And like the, there's less of that like survival instinct. Um, you know, like when 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 you when you you know found your success when you've done the work to become a functioning part and when you retire, like I think that's the time when you should like, oh well. I have time to read more stories. That's that's the experience, experiment that I have with me and my dad. Like we're just reading a lot about the Asian experience. And like, you know, I think we've lived in, you know, feeling that our struggle is like the most ultimate struggle. Like, the, yeah, we did survive a genocide, but, you know, there there are other communities that feel similar, you know, or have gone gone through worse too. You know, there, there, there are 
the new immigrant class of Muslim Southeast Asian communities that have like been through essentially a genocide. You have an Asian community that lives on the uh, on the west coast, well, or the, not the west coast of the west of China in Xinjiang, that's been oppressed, that's been in a genocide. You know that that are moving abroad, or if they can escape, then then they can move abroad. So, like, I I think what I'm trying to get at is like, don't just put our struggle in a pedestal and just say like, and like devalue other people's experiences. It's like, oh, like your experience wasn't as bad as my experience, like. It's like, well, like, this is not a competition of like how no, bad you had not. it. This is not a competition. The, 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 the recognition, the understanding that we've been through something and how we can help others. I think that should be more valued than, oh, I struggle way more than you. So, so you, you are forced to respect me. It's like, you will never get respect if you're living in that type of lifestyle. It's, it's really, it's really childish. And, and I think it's a very immature mindset. It's not. It's dangerous when it comes to um, talking about race and and struggles, mm-hmm. uh, but it definitely comes from just casual conversations, like everyday things, like oh, saying my life is harder than yours because I'm studying this uh, this topic, I'm studying this major, and it's harder than your topic. Mm-hmm. You know, not as dangerous, but it can. It, it's that same mindset that translates into. Um, my race has struggled more than yours. Yeah, you know, that reminded me, I know, like, this is a little bit outside of race, but I remember that, um, uh, that, that YouTube video where there's like Dr. Mike and like the lawyer from like Legal Eagle. And he was, uh, and it, I think they played it jokingly. It's like, I struggle more than you in law school. I struggle more than you in medical school. I'm like, y'all are in different professions that do different <laughs> things. What are you talking about? And I know it's played for last, but like right, in, right. in the frame of um, what I mentioned in the last podcast about like Asian infighting, it's like, why are we trying to compare our struggles with other people like we come from the same continent a similar continent like we've all struggled in our own unique way like how can we lift each other up in this in this case if the high school graduation rate is low for southeast uh, southeast asian communities how are we gonna like like what can we do to work together to make sure we get as many asians into college or just finishing their high school diplomas, you know, in Long mm-hmm. Beach, like that, that was a big deal in the C- Cambodian American community. Not a lot of us go through high school. And I'll be honest, I, I didn't know that um, Southeast Asian uh, young folks weren't graduation rates weren't as high mm-hmm. as, um, you know, just, I guess, the East Asian uh, community. And yeah. that's not something, that's not data that, uh, that comes out. There's no, I always thought that, oh, a- Asian as a whole, our families value education and, you know, we all go to college or something. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, it's not, it's not a nice, simple data, just, just one set of data we can look at. Mm-hmm. And and it's like it, if for folks that are um, like tr- trying to stay within that model minority, they try to like segregate that away or just put a blanket statement like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, all Asians make about above a white person. And like, you know, like that's the only minority that can like make this amount of money. It's like, well, if you don't segregate the data and understand that uh, there are communities that don't fit that bill you know there are communities right. that may relate to the struggle of latinx communities and the black community and things like um and things like that like mm-hmm. if you don't try to say break it down and say hey these are our blind spots how can we make sure that this community can all also prosper in in, in the land of milk and honey essentially so uh we're about to need to finish up time yeah i do i want to respect your time i i, I want to ask you and you don't need to answer this question um but i do wanted to cap this this podcast with have you you personally or somebody in like your friend group had dealt with asian american bias in the course of this whole pandemic and feel free to just say yeah i'm not answering that um oh, okay. we can just finish no, the podcast but- i 
I, I would definitely like to answer that because I feel like I want to get my story out there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to let other Asian folks who are watching this podcast and non-Asian folks watching this podcast that, you know, um, I'm just a regular person, just like anybody else. And yes, I, I have, uh, I have been based, I have seen racism and it has been, uh, um, something that it's, well, I don't want to say like that I struggle, but I'm a victim of, of an Asian, uh, bias. Mm-hmm. This was, this was in my own community. This was at, at our local, uh, grocery store. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, that's the funny thing for me, it was in a local, it it was almost like a grocery store, but it's more like a specialty grocery store. It was like an Italian market, not the staff. I would like to say that. Yeah, uh, mine is not the staff as well. It was just another customer. Yeah, it was just another customer. The, the customer was like just walking around just like he it's like you kind of mentally kind of understood this was the beginning of the pandemic that was just trying to like make mm-hmm. our my quarantine pizza and so i just needed to buy a few things this individual like kind of saw that oh this guy's asian right like he always would look around us like trying to see where i'm at and where i am in the store mm-hmm. there was a situation where i was about to check out and like it's the way it's set up it's like a little island And at the end of the islands would be your registers. And like, I guess if you were to say like, this is the island, this would be one register. This is another register. He would turn the corner and see me. And then he would like have to like walk back. It's like, oh shit, like walk back. And I was just kind of like thinking, oh, is this like a case of anti-Asian bias? Like there was no violence. You're spooking him, man. You're spooking him. That's so weird. (laughs) It's so weird. I was just like, I'm just having a normal conversation with the other staff. I'm like, you know, being nice and courteous and things like that. And by the time that that guy like walked up and was like, oh shit, like walked back. I was just like, (laughs) to me, I started laughing because there was no, there was no really violence against me, but I, I understood what that was. I understood like, oh, he's just trying to put me at arm's length because I'm Asian. And like, you know, the coronavirus is like two months in and I'm just like, Oh, okay. So this is this is the most lightest of light versions of right, Asian right. American bias. Like I'm not, <laughs> I don't know if I like at the time, like I don't think it was worth enough to report because I, I didn't got physically assaulted, but mm-hmm. it was just something of note that I'm like, oh, I guess this is happening now. This is right, right. This is the world we're living in at the moment. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I don't know how specific you want me to get in this into this story. It's up to you if you want to just say that you know it happened to you and just leave it as that. Like I okay, yeah. I can tell you. Uh, so you, you can either cut it out like the full leg, or you can. I could cut it. Uh, like or, you mean, like cut it out. Uh, up and... to you. I can tell you uh, the story two different times. Or what happened? If it's or you're good. I th- I think I'm good if if it's comfortable for you to do. Okay, okay. You know, I'm I'm not gonna force you to say anything. I just said mine because you know I I just right right right. Half the conversation. Yeah, I'm comfortable. I just don't know if if YouTube will will like it. Um, I'm not even sponsored by anybody, so all yeah, right, just go for it. <laughs> cool. So this is at the time where I was working at Walmart, um, and. My manager was right behind me stocking shelves and I was assisting a customer with a lockbox. This customer came up to me and uh, asked me if it was a specific product. And I had to explain to that customer, oh, I don't know if it's that specific product because it's a mystery box. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you it is within the set of of this line of the mystery box. Yeah, yeah. And I told him that if you weren't happy or if you're not satisfied with your product, you can always return it, even if it's open. It's Walmart. Mm-hmm. Um, and he insulted my intelligence saying, uh, how you work here, how do you not know if it's that product? Uh, which, which is really bizarre because I guess he didn't understand what the concept of a mystery box was. Mm-hmm. And he kept telling me saying, he didn't understand why I couldn't help him find the product. Mm -hmm. He kept saying, I'm buying this toy for my daughter, who is your race. And I decided to challenge that. I asked him, sir, how does this information help me help you? Oh, my God. Yeah. 
and this is at our local Walmart, you know, where we have a very diverse uh, neighborhood. And he he kept bringing it up saying, oh, my my brother is in the army and his wife is your race. His daughter is also your race. Why are you not helping me? This is, it, this is, yeah, that's, yep. that's no, 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 no. He also pulled down his mask to talk to me. And I, my immediate reaction was like, whoa, sir, you got to put that on. And he was like, it, it felt like he was insinuating that um, I didn't understand him because I didn't understand English. When you were just perfectly like speaking yeah. English a moment ago. And I was like, sir, you got to put on your mask. And he was like, oh, I didn't, I wasn't sure if you understood me. So I, I had that vibe that, do you, do you speak English kind of vibe? Yeah, that is that. Yeah. Right. And this whole time while I was dealing with this customer, um, my manager was standing right behind me stocking shelves. And my, my, my supervisor was a, was a very tall and, and like a larger Latino man. Mm -hmm. And the customer was also a, a Latino man. And I was really confused. I was like, why, why did he not intervene? Mm -hmm. um, one, I don't get paid enough to deal with this. I honestly shouldn't have just, yo, help him out. Mm -hmm. um, and his wife was just standing behind him. like It's enabling this person. Like right. you know, she wasn't, she was kind of holding him back, but right. not verbally. She didn't tell him to stop, mm, but she okay. just kind of like stared him down. That of course that <laughs> didn't help. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's a coughing fit. Yeah, like she she didn't even convene or say anything at all. No, no. And recently, I had actually learned uh, through the Walmart app that mm -hmm. the, the, the leaders in the leadership positions and the supervisor positions there, they had a program to teach their supervisors to intervene during these racial, uh, racial discrimination or, or attacks and stuff like that, mm -hmm. which, you know, obviously didn't happen in my case. Yeah. And that was the last day you had in Walmart. <laughs> yes. Yes. I reported it to his managers and mm -hmm. his managers, unfortunately, very very fortunate really ticked me off um they refused to acknowledge that that experience had happened to me mm -hmm. and they said if that had happened the manager would have intervened what the hell like the manager was like right behind you yeah How is that... yes yeah they you know basically his managers discredited my experience saying that that didn't happen to me mm -hmm. and that I, I was I was raging, <laughs> of course, when when that happened, and I threw the towel. And... That that that's why I feel very strongly about worker power. <laughs> in this case, I'm like that. You know, and I I think that's also in in like um a, relating to the whole like you know devaluing of like Asian voices or like mm -hmm. you know people that just work like uh, like all you want to do is work but whenever these things happen like you should be represented you should be um like treated as as somebody that needs some you know like as someone to address this issue you know right right I, yeah. I was wondering too after I left if um they recognized that uh racism racist attacks on on Asians was a real thing or, or not because they yeah. refused to acknowledge at least my experience yeah that's I'm just the, thinking of the all the times like you know there are companies that like publicly say it's like oh we don't stand for racism and things like that right, like, right. but at the same time like if your managers don't follow up with that or or do anything to like you know in the action of you know customers doing this to you in the action of like in some cases your your um employees or your employer would do that to you like you need to be represented you need to be mm -hmm. you know given a chance to say this is my truth this is this is what had happened and i just that's that shouldn't that's for you, like that experience, like shouldn't happen again. But I think this is a constant experience for many, 
you know, n- not just Asian Americans, but for a lot of people of color in 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 working spaces. Right. But I think at this very this current moment, like it's highlighted now. You know, with yeah, the- my experience is not is not unique. I mm-hmm. know I know tons of other uh, Asian people in our community that have had similar issues. Okay. Well, um, hopefully, um, if you feel comfortable for me to post this, um, we'll, we'll have it up. Uh, this would just be an unedited portion of the podcast but okay. um if, if if folks um find out there's this cut in between the section i understand that you know telling your truth can be a very personal thing and mm-hmm. and like i wanted to rec- uh, respect isabella's you know you know privacy in the matter and so um if it is cut out hi hello um and bye <laughs> i guess thank you for watching and um, hope you stick around. Where we're gonna, we're, I might want to have us two more podcasts to address, you know, Asian American bias. Like I said before, with Black Lives Matter and like understanding Black struggle, like it's not, it doesn't end. You know, like the talking about um, issues in uh, communities of color doesn't just end with podcasts. Like it's always a constant conversation, and I don't think. You, you know, like we'll never address it, but I just expected that, you know, uh, when it comes by or when we want to talk about it, we'll just talk about it. And uh, if you're tired, I guess you'll need to find another YouTuber, I guess. I, I don't know how to help you if you're tired of me talking about it. So thank you for watching. And um, and thank you, Isabella, for uh, agreeing to be on the podcast and talking about something very heavy. And, and, and yeah, and thank you again. Well, thank you for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. And it's uh, thank you for watching and educate yourself and your family members. Awesome. Thank you.